<laughs> All right, next thing's from me. Uh, it's from the Chinese Space Program, which, as many of you will be aware, is kicking up into a much higher gear and trying to catch up with the Russian and the American powers. And it looks well set to do that, because next week... Um, Somewhere around the 27th to the 30th of September, um, the Chinese research group is due to launch an unmanned space lab into Ooh. orbit. And it's going to be um, the first in a long series of steps that will culminate with, um, hopefully, with Chinese uh, having a docking station up there um, orbiting the Earth. And, and that should be up by about, when was it? 2020 is when they're planning it for, hmm. and they're actually looking at trying to send a mo- man, um, a Chinese man to the moon <laughs> after 2020. That's the kind of plan. There's uh, a moon landing and a moon rover due for 2012, and China's only the third nation worldwide to have ever participated in a spacewalk outside of a spacecraft after uh, USA and Russia. So it's really encouraging where there, um, when we're seeing so many budget cuts across the board yeah. for the other space agencies. That China's, that China's putting so much uh, time and effort and care into their particular space mm. program. It's really encouraging to see. Stepping into the breach. It's it's marvelous. I mean, they're one of the few countries on Earth at the moment who, who frankly, has the resources and the, and the money to do it. Um, and so, yeah, everyone's everyone's very chuffed about that. Of course, it will be interesting to see how um, a Chinese uh, space program might uh, be similar or different to uh, the other space programs that are currently in existence. The other thing about it is that they're putting really short concrete timelines on it. For instance, uh, 2012, 2017 is when they want their lunar samples back and then man to the moon by 2020. That's, mm. in, that's quick. That's nine years, which is a good chunk. Uh, comparing, comparing this to NASA's plans via um, <laughs> President Obama, which is to have a human expedition to an asteroid by 2025 and a journey to Mars by the 2030s, which is uh, the equivalent of waving your hands in the air and okay. saying, it's the future. And, of course, that's that's a presidential thing with, with oh. any new power structures that come in or any new presidents. It's entirely possible that they'll be like, no, <laughs> we don't want to. Completely wanna. thrown out the window. <laughs> yeah, so great stuff. Um, a couple of uh, short things uh, and then a slightly longer one. Um, these are some interesting videos that we've come across, so we, we will have, obviously, links posted to them on the blog. Uh, the first one is a time-lapse video, just about a minute, uh, taken from the front of the International Space Station as it orbited our planet at night. Um, it started over the Pacific Ocean and then sort of continues going around. Uh, it goes over North and South America um, and then enters daylight near Antarctica. And it's absolutely stunning. It's it's just it's a minute of magic, so that's very cool. Um, the other one is uh, on IOP or physics. World, which is a really sort of interesting, is a journal and an online website and all kinds of stuff. Um, there are for IOP members, which is uh, pretty cheap to to do. Um, there are some videos because, <clears throat> well, in fact, they're all about Rutherford. So there's one about Rutherford's legacy to Manchester. Um, there's how there's one on how Rutherford shaped nuclear physics, and because it is, it's the centenary of Rutherford's, you know, large discoveries. People also just talking about it generally and, and, and a hundred years on and how, what they think of it and, and what it sort of means to us, the discovery and, and Rutherford himself. So those are quite fun. Go and have a look at those. Yeah, if you just want something to pass the time, get your hands on a hundred dollar note. You can see some of Rutherford, you can see Rutherford's Nobel Prize and his atomic decay curve on there as well. That's true, actually. I'd forgotten about that. Cool. Thank you. Um, and then the next one is, it's also pretty short because it's really confusing, but I always love sort of quantum shredding uh, equation type stuff because it just does fun things to my brain and I like having my brain turned inside out. <laughs> so <laughs> this isn't new so much as um, the author, uh, George Musso, who, who sort of writes about this sort of stuff, uh, came across the idea recently in a lecture and it's <laughs> what he calls the quantum Cheshire cat. And basically we're all familiar with the idea of Schrodinger's uh, cat in the box thing where basically... Uh, to paraphrase, enormously the cat can be both alive and dead at the same time until you look at it and collapse the waveform, basically. Uh, the idea here is that it's an elaboration of, of that thought experiment. So you've got a cat, and it's either purring or meowing, and it's curled up in one of two boxes. So in the same, in, in sorry, as in Schrodinger's uh, scenario, you then couple the cat to some quantum system like a, a radioactive atom, uh, basically a way of making the condition ambiguous, and, uh, well, until you examine all the boxes. So, but this is where it gets weird. If you reach into box two, you feel the cat. And if you listen to the boxes, you hear purring. But when you listen more closely, you notice that the purring is coming from box one. You've separated the cat from the purr. And there are two different boxes. Now you ask, how on earth 
does this make any sense or, or what would this be applicable to? And you can basically do it with an electron, at least in the thought experiment. You can have the electron in one box and its spin in the other. Um, and there are, and, and the article goes on to sort of explain how this might be possible mathematically <laughs> and what's going on, but ends with uh, the author going, yeah, I'm very confused by this as well. It's quite interesting. And uh, next week in... Uh, I think, yes, um, in, well, at least in an upcoming issue of Scientific American, there's going to be some more details on it. <laughs> I'm definitely <laughs> going to keep my eye on that and try and figure out what that it, means. <laughs> it's, it's just, I just love the idea of, of a cat in one box and the purr in the other. So, yeah, have, have a look and, and read of it. It's certainly something I'd like to chat with people about. So if you've got any ideas, do get in touch. <laughs> Where does it stop? So there's going to be one cat in four boxes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, yes. Um, Maybe. We're not talking about the, the Herald article today about the crazy man and his cats, by the way. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> right. Next thing for me is slightly easier to understand. It has real-world implications and <laughs> real-world applications. There's a new gene therapy trial which may very well have prompted a cure for <laughs> HIV. So last week we... Um, we mentioned several different vaccines and ways to make cells immune to the HIV virus. Yes. But uh, last year, a Berlin man by the name of Timothy Brown actually became the first human being ever, we think, to be cured of HIV. And this actually came about because he had uh, he had cancer as well as HIV, the poor guy, and he got a bone wow. marrow transplant from a donor. The donor cells actually lacked this important uh, receptor, which it turns out HIV binds to. So huh. uh, he got a whole bunch of cells that were immune to HIV. Then they replaced all his immune cells. He became healthy, and all of his cells then became immune to HIV. So wow. um, once doctors became aware of this, they got very, very excited because it's a cure, not a vaccine for uh, HIV. Mm. And then they tried to replicate it. So what they've done now is they've treated 15 patients using gene therapy. This is where you get the genes so in this case, what they've done is they've looked at that particular receptor that makes people um, uh, not susceptible. Immune. Susceptible, that's the word <laughs> I was looking for, that makes people susceptible to the HIV virus. They've got a zinc, a zinc finger endonuclease, which is just a, a standard... Um, standard technique for disassembling proteins. They've essentially mm. screwed up that receptor on all these cells, 10 billion cells from each individual patient, wow. and then re-injected them into patients. Mm. And in one of these patients, they have observed the HIV infection plummet even though he stopped taking all of his antiviral drugs. Wow. And I've never, ever seen this result before on anyone that stopped taking the antiretroviral drugs. And that's a really interesting result, but it's only one. This is a very, very small study, and mm. I can't emphasize that enough, but it yep. is an encouraging result, just like Timothy Brown's uh, result was an encouraging result. Exactly. I mean, this is this is the great thing, uh, and, and even with the, the stuff like Folded, is you, you take the problem, and this is science, you attack it on as many different fronts as you possibly can, and, and one is patient and does the science properly and answers will present themselves sometimes it just takes a while yeah but but lovely to see that happening because man hiv <laughs> it's not cool we're very happy to see it go away and uh, also the other 14 participants of the study um the, the problem with testing that is that they're still still on their antiretrovirals because oh. of course you don't want to take them off their antiretrovirals no. because if the therapy hasn't worked then they'll cark it so um it's a very very hard hypothesis to test but absolutely one with huge implications. Hmm. Super clever. Really, really, really clever indeed. All right, mine's mine's a, a little bit of a fun one. <laughs> um, and this is a, a new study uh, looking at why intuition may make people more likely to believe in God. So in this study, uh, which was 882 participants with an average age of 33 and 64% female uh, composition, they got them to fill out an online survey um about their belief in a higher power, a god of some sort, and then they were given a cognitive test, and the cognitive test was made up of three maths questions, all of which had uh, an obvious but um, incorrect intuitive answer. So uh, one of the examples given here is a bat and a ball cost one uh, $1.10 in total. The bat costs $1 more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? The intuitive answer is $0.10. Cents. Um, the correct answer is five cents, of course. Um, and they found that people who are highly intuitive thinkers, which uh, uh, the way they're defining intuitive is reach a decision fast and intuitively and then sort of stick with it, whereas reflective thinkers are more likely to sort of mull something over more slowly, look at it from all the angles, all of that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so people who chose the uh, incorrect answer tended to be more intuitive. And there were some people who got it wrong on all three. 
uh, in that sense. And they found that, yes, they were far more likely um, to believe in, in God or a higher power. Now, they then go on to say, look, we're not necessarily saying which is causative of which. It could be that belief in a God predisposes you towards thinking more intuitively. We're not sure. They're, they're not sure what the results mean at all, and they're likely to be very controversial, whatever they are. They also um, are at great pains to say that, look, it's not that there's one type of thinking that's better than the other. People need both. Um, certainly the, the intuitive thinkers were no less intelligent than the reflective thinkers. It's just a different type of thinking style. Um, so, yeah, I have no pretty answers for you on that, but it's a really, really interesting uh, result. I think it's a really interesting um, article. Speaking of uh, intuition and humans' response to data and information, the one of the big news items this week um, was the earthquake scientists who have been put on trial in Italy for their um, or for the predictions or lack of predictions that they made around the large earthquake um, <clears throat> that killed uh, over 300 people, unfortunately. So if, if you're not up to date with this, what's happened is that these scientists uh, came out and made a whole bunch of predictions around these low-level shocks that uh, Italy was having, and that got interpreted by a, uh, a politician, and then that then got relayed to the public. And the politician took what the scientists said, essentially, and said there's no chance of there being a big quake. Right after he said that, there was a big quake and hundreds of people died. So they're being sued for um, misrepresenting themselves and misrepresenting their case. And depending on how this particular case turns out, and we won't know the results for months and months and months, it could have really a huge impact on how willing scientists are to discuss their data mm. and the implications of their research, which I think is a really sad thing. I think it's pretty shocking. If, if one goes and looks at the um, details, so the government official who said this is also being sued with the scientists, but my understanding, and Elf, please do correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong on this, is that basically they said, from the data that we have, we can't say that there will or won't be a big earthquake. They were basically saying, we, we, we cannot say. We, we've got nothing that says there will be a big one. We've got nothing that says there won't. The government official then turned that into, there is no chance of a large earthquake. Mm. So you could argue that perhaps he should be in trouble for getting it so egregiously wrong. And this happens all the time in science reporting and people talking about sort of statistical stuff is they don't really understand what is being said and that the message gets twisted. Um, but but one could also argue that the, the scientist who said this should have said something when they noticed that his message was incorrect. So certainly a very interesting set of issues there that need to be um, thought through. But but I think the general reaction is that people are absolutely appalled that scientists would be dragged up um, into court for something like this. Yeah, and I mean, just just to put the, uh, perspective on this particular example, there is no scientific consensus worldwide on a reliable method for predicting earthquakes. Absolutely. There never has been, despite what any nutters <laughs> might say. Um, <laughs> There is no evidence. Uh, you can't predict it through looking at tremor, existing tremors. You can't predict it from gas activity. You can't predict it from climate conditions. You can't predict it from anything. You can't even predict it from the moon. <laughs> yeah. and, indeed. So bringing these up, bringing these scientists to account for saying that we can't <laughs> predict this um, in either positively or negatively is really a fundamental misunderstanding of probability, I think, yeah. which happens, sadly, a lot more than I'd like. Than we, than we would like to. So everyone is going to be watching that very, very closely, and I imagine if it looks like the scientists are going to get in trouble, there will be howls, and, and, and things could get seriously interesting. And Peter Griffin on Cyblogs uh, does give an extremely good uh, account of this from both sides. Uh, so he take does. a look at the Cyblogs post. We'll link to it, as per usual. Absolutely.